Welcome, dear listeners, to the Carolina Hates Podcast, brought to you by Rake Havoc Productions and A Darker World. I'm your host, Dan Sellers. August 27th, 1891, Hugh Linster arrived for work at the railway station at Statesville, North Carolina. He checked his watch, 2 a.m., he heard the familiar sound of the blow-down valve on the big steam locomotive as the engineer vented ash to ensure that the pressure pipes were clear. He knew that the engineer and his crew had already been here for over an hour. He knew that they had performed their inspection of the locomotive and the passenger cars. He knew that the fire was being carefully stoked in the engine's hearth. He knew that the boiler had been filled to a precise level, ensuring optimal steam pressure through the system. He knew, well, he knew every aspect of steam train operations. He should. He had worked here for over 40 years. And he also knew that they were running behind schedule. Finally, he heard the click-clack of the coupler as the engineer hooked up to the passenger cars. He heard the steam engine cycle as train number 9 of the Richmond and Danville Railroad line began to pull up to the station. He checked his watch. Again, he knew it was 2.25 a.m., but he checked his watch anyway. His shiny new watch. He checked it because he was proud of the first new watch he had ever owned. He checked it because he could. But mostly, he checked it trying to decide if he wanted this day to hurry up and be over, or if he wanted it to last forever. This was to be his last run, his last day. He was retiring. So he checked his shiny new watch that the R&D Railroad had given him as a retirement gift. He was sitting on the platform with a hundred or so passengers waiting for the train to pull up to the station. It was August, and even at that early hour, the air was humid and sticky. But Asheville, the train's destination, would be cooler. Finally, the train pulled up to the platform, and the passengers began boarding. And Hugh Linster, the baggage master, began stowing the passenger's luggage into the baggage compartment. With this task complete, Hugh looked around the platform to make sure they hadn't missed anything. The only other person on the platform was the engineer. The two men nodded to one another. Everything in order, Hugh? The engineer asked. Yes, sir. As the two men boarded the train, Hugh checked his watch. It was almost 3 a.m. But the train wouldn't make it to Asheville. It barely made it out of Statesville. On the edge of town, the tracks cut through Mr. Boston's property. There, the Boston's bridge crossed the Third Creek. The bridge was no small feat of engineering in itself. It spanned almost 200 feet and was formed from five huge stone and concrete arches, the largest of which stood over 60 feet high. The train derailed as soon as it started to cross the bridge and plummeted 60 feet to the creek below. Mrs. Boston was startled awake by the crash. The whole family was. They quickly dressed and ran out the front porch. There, they were shocked to hear the wails of the injured. Mrs. Boston sent her son into town to get help while she went with her grandson to the crash site. By the time her son had come back, she had organized a triage of sorts. Those with the worst injuries were on her front porch, and the ones with the least wounds she put inside. Two rows of dead bodies lay on the front lawn. Twenty-three people perished 
in the Boston Bridge incident. Later that day, Mrs. Boston walked slowly down the line of the deceased, a tear in her eye. No one knows what she was thinking as she did. Perhaps she asked herself the questions you ask in the wake of such a tragedy. How? Why? Or perhaps she was too stunned to think of anything at all. On the walk, looking down at their faces, some of them she recognized. Some were unrecognizable. She stopped in front of one man. He clutched a new watch in his hand, its face as shattered as his own. Hugh Linster died that day from a broken neck. The number nine train had been running a bit late that fateful August morning. So the engineer had her close to wide open. They hit the bridge at about 40 miles per hour. The train carried such momentum that the massive machine was airborne for 150 feet before smashing into the far bank of the creek. But speed was not a factor in the accident. The Richmond and Danville Railroad investigated the incident and found that someone had removed most of the spikes that held the tracks in place. They mounted a manhunt and detained several people, but the saboteurs wouldn't be identified for another six years. When two men were overheard bragging about selling stolen railroad spikes for scrap, unfortunately, it was their own cellmates who overheard them. The two men were already serving a life sentence for unrelated crimes, so... Really, was justice ever served for the victims of train number nine? Exactly one year later, the Boston family was once again startled awake by a loud crash, followed by screams and what sounded like dying moans. Fearing the worst, they all rushed to the bridge. A small rise blocked their view from the creek. As they neared the hill, a man stumbled toward them. The others rushed over the hill while Mrs. Boston stopped to help the man. He wore a cap and his head was down, obscuring his face. He looked at the watch in his hand. Its face was smashed. My watch, he mumbled, obviously in shock. Do you know the time, ma'am? Mrs. Boston thought the watch seemed familiar but she couldn't place it until the man looked at her. My watch! It was the face of the man who had laid dead in her yard one year ago today. Hugh Linster. (laughs) Meanwhile, the screams had faded away over the hill. She ran to the top of it and found nothing but an empty field. Her family wandered around, confused. Mrs. Boston looked back at Hugh, but he too faded away as she watched. And so the legend was born. It was soon said that the wreck at Boston's Bridge reoccurs every year on the night of its anniversary. August 27th, 1941. 50 years to the day of the tragedy. A married couple stalled out near the train tracks in their car. After the man goes off on foot to get help, his wife, left alone in the dark, witnesses the train crash. Upon the man's return, she tells him she heard the horrific crash and the sounds of screaming and moaning coming from the passengers. They rushed into town to report the accident, only to return soon afterward to find nothing. August 27th, 1991. 100 years to the day. Crowds and crowds of curious folk make their way to the bridge to witness what they thought would be a repeat of history. 
They waited and waited. And then around 2 a.m., they claimed the nearby railroad crossing arms began to sound and deploy to stop traffic. However, no train passed along the tracks over the bridge. You know, the funny thing about legends is that sometimes they make us look for things that may not really be there. For example, the story that Michael Renegar tells is a man named Willie who was walking home from his sister's house late one night. To get home, he would have to walk across the Bosch in property. That meant he had two choices. He could either brave a barbed wire fence, cross a pasture riddled with cow paddy landmines, cross the creek, scale another barbed wire fence, and scurry up an embankment covered with briars. Or he could simply walk across the bridge. He chose the bridge. About halfway across, he realized his mistake. Today was the 27th, he remembered. August 27th. He didn't own a watch, but he had left his sister's well after midnight, so it had to be close to 3 a.m. As if on cue, he heard the huff and chug of a steam train coming toward him. He sprinted across the bridge before it got to him. He made it to the other side and dove off the tracks. Then a great rush of wind swept over him like the train speeding past. But he saw nothing. Well, not quite nothing. He saw the silhouette of a man cresting the hill and looking at his watch. Willie, do you know what time it is? The man asked. At six foot four, 230 pounds, Willie wasn't scared of very much. But ghosts were ghosts. He screamed like a teenage girl and ran all the way back home. Now let's back up a few minutes before all this happened. An Iredell County Sheriff's Deputy was out on patrol when his vehicle stopped running. He coasted to a stop on the edge of the road while his car made all sorts of squealing and banging noises that cars just shouldn't make. He called it in and he waited on help. But, as tends to happen, nature called. He looked around and decided his only option was to go over the hill beside the road and relieve himself. As he topped the hill, he saw a man dive off the railroad tracks into the bushes. The moon was behind him, so he could recognize Willie right away. What was Willie doing here jumping into the bushes at three in the morning? He didn't realize that Willie could only see his silhouette. Willie! He called. Do you have any idea what time it is? That's when Willie screamed and ran away. The two men would laugh about that night for years to come. But did Willie really hear a phantom train? Or was it the sheriff's ailing patrol car? A few years ago, a group of amateur ghost hunters did, indeed, encounter something on the bridge. In Charlotte, a group of about a dozen people learned about the legend and being August 27th, 2010, they decided on a whim to head to Statesville and see what would happen. There was no time to ask for permission to be on the property and they did not take the time to do their due diligence in researching the situation. They arrived at the bridge just before 3 a.m. and spread out on and around it to see what would happen. Several minutes later, they were astounded to hear the sound of a train coming toward them. Now if they had taken the time to ask the property owner, or even consult a train schedule online, they would have known that what they were hearing was a real Norfolk Southern freight train pulled by three large locomotives and barreling straight toward them. When they realized they were in trouble, they sprinted back along the narrow bridge. All but two made it. One woman jumped off the side and fell about 12 feet to the ground. 
she had to be rushed to a trauma center in Charlotte to treat her injuries. But 29-year-old Christopher Kaiser was struck by the train and killed. To learn more about this story, check out Ghosts of the North Carolina Piedmont, Haunted Houses and Unexplained Events by Francis Castevens. Check out Roadside Revenants and Other North Carolina Ghosts and Legends by Michael Reniker. And check out the episode from WRAL's The Tar Hill Traveler. This episode was researched and written by Jeffrey Cochran. It was hosted and produced by me, Dan Sellers. You can find everything Jeff's up to at adarkerworld.com. And you can find everything that we're up to at Recap It Productions at recapitproductions.com. Our fundraising campaign on Indiegogo has come to an end, and I'd like to thank Rebecca Jordan and Stephanie Griffin. Without your contributions, we wouldn't be able to research the book the way it deserves. I can't wait to put a copy of this book in your hands. That's right, Jeffrey Cochran and I are hard at work on a Carolina Haynes book and we plan to have it ready for publishers later this year. You can find more about it and everything else we're up to at our company by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, Wreak Havoc All Access. Just visit wreakhavocblog.site to sign up. We're on Instagram at Wreak Havoc Productions, and I'm on Twitter at Hank vs. The Undead. You can email me any questions you might have at recapitproductions at gmail.com. Take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. And be sure to share this with your friends. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. Tune in then to hear more about the things that go bump in the night. <laughs>